Well, good afternoon. I would like to thank all of you today for uh, coming to IDFA today to participate in our webinar on the topic of water management best practices. Uh, my name is Danielle Quist. I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Council at IDFA, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, for many dairy processors, effective water management has become a matter of improving a plant's sustainability metrics. But water management has also become a critical priority as the cost of incoming water increases and water supply becomes limited and restricted. So today, IDFA Gold Business Partner, Hickson Architecture and Engineering will address these concerns head on, sharing strategies, technologies, and processes for reducing your plant's overall water footprint. So we hope with this webinar that you'll be able to recognize the reasons for a higher risk of increased water use and restrictions in the future, that you'll be able to identify various strategies and practices for reducing water consumption, and you'll be able to identify technologies and processes for reducing water consumption. And finally, that you can develop both short-term and long-term water consumption strategies. So before we get started, I would like to just cover a little bit of housekeeping. Um, all lines, your, all your lines are placed on mute and the webinar recording and slides will be available in the Knowledge Center under the webinars tab. And if you have any difficulties with, the, with technology, please email us at membership at idfa.org. And please, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature throughout the webinar, and we'll save some time at the end to, to ask the questions. So I'd like to move on now and introduce our speakers for today. Um, the first is, um, is uh, Joe Weisgerber. Uh, he's the manager for environment, environmental engineering, health and safety at Hickson. He has nearly 25 years of experience in the industry where he's involved in projects of all sizes and a wide variety of industry segments. So Joe leads a team which helps solve its clients pollution uh, prevention issues, emissions control, environmental permitting and reporting, safety and regulatory interpretation, Joe also offers a wealth of knowledge and experience in areas such as air quality permitting, waste system evaluation and design, multimedia compliance auditing, air emissions inventories, and phase one due diligence. Uh, Joe is a chemical engineer, and he's also a professional engineer and certified professional environmental auditor. I'd also like to introduce Warren Green. Uh, Warren leads a team which provides core processing design services, process optimization, process safety evaluations, waste and energy minimization studies, and master planning. And prior to joining Hickson in 2002, Warren spent 15 years at Dow Corning in process design, research and development, plant engineering, and enterprise management training. Uh, Warren is also a professional engineer and is, uh, is has a degree in chemical engineering. Um, two wonderful speakers with a lot of with a lot of history for dairy, and um, would like to hand it over to them to begin the uh, substantive part of this webinar. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Danielle. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, we'll talk about water management best practices today. And let's get started with the why. Why is that important? Why should you care about it? Um, I think you all know it, it is important, but that deeper understanding is what we're after today. Uh, one, on the increasing cost side, I'm sure you all have heard of infrastructure in the news lately. Um, there's a big push to increase federal spun spending there. And that's been going on for a long time. You know, there's always a push to increase spending in this area because as we can see from a couple of articles here, um, nine years ago, they were predicting $384 billion needed to just maintain the existing infrastructure. It's underground, unseen, and a lot of times cities and states 
do other things with their money than maintain infrastructure. But just four years later, another uh, infrastructure report card article shows that over a trillion dollars was then estimated to maintain and expand the infrastructure. That expansion is important because as you know, populations don't stay in one place, populations tend to move around. And the manufacturing sector tries to move along with them, but the infrastructure is always lagging. And so there's always this lag between where the population is going and how fast that infrastructure can keep up with them. Now, there is a little bit of good news in that second report in 2017. And over the previous decade to that report, for the first time in 40 years, they showed that municipal drinking water production had actually decreased by 5%. Well, that's partly because of more efficient fixtures in residential and commercial buildings, some already ongoing efforts in the manufacturing field and also some larger coal-fired power plants had retired, and they were large water users. Is that going to be the new normal? Is that going to keep decreasing, or is that just a one-time reduction? We don't know yet. We'll have to see. The second part to increasing costs is that demand in certain locations is outpacing the supply. So that means the water utilities must go further to obtain water, and that drives up the costs. Your cheap, good quality water reservoirs are being depleted, and we're having to use more poor quality water, which requires more treatment, and more treatment is more cost. And like we said before, the population shift, that demand is no longer in the same place as the infrastructure that supports it. So the other part of water management, in addition to the increase in costs, is that limited or restricted supply. And we're seeing shortages in some area. So not only is it a factor of how much do we have to treat the water and the demand is higher, but also the supply is shrinking in some areas. And I say some is sort of tongue in cheek because as you can see these two articles, first in 2003, 36 states anticipate some shortages in drinking water. And then we go to 2014, we're up to 40 states. That's 80% of the states. So it doesn't look like there's some regional shortages. This looks like a more national issue. And so the regional shortages we talked about on the previous slide are either aquifers, rivers, reservoirs, and that's on the long-term scale. We also have short-term scales for locations that pull uh, their water from uh, temporary sources. They're dependent on snowpack melt or rainfall. So you can see, you know, everybody remembers a few years ago in the news, California was going through a very bad three-year drought. Um, they said the Mead Lake was at its lowest level since the 1930s in the Dust Bowl era. So very drastic droughts there. But just a year later, California had a very good rainfall year and water shortages were um, alleviated. There wasn't a shortage for that year. So that variation can go up and down in regional areas. So that defines what we mean by why is the water management important. You have all these influences, cost, shortages, supply versus demand, and they all add up. What that adds up to is a lack of consistent quality water at an affordable price, and that will definitely threaten the plant viability. So Many manufacturing areas have looked towards water recovery and reuse to get significant reductions in water consumption. If the supply is not there, you have to do better with what you have. And that's the real risk 
in what we're looking at for the dairy sector. The dairy-based operations are going to have to react to the water supply changes more successfully. So let's take a little bit here to help define some of the terms we're going to be talking about. And again, talk about that deeper understanding of what's going on here with the water. Everybody knows Water's going to come from a reservoir, a river, a lake, goes to the water treatment plant. You're paying for that water to use it. And then most of the time, the traditional dairy plant, the water just goes straight down the drain. Maybe you do a little bit of pretreatment. Maybe that's pH, probably a grease interceptor. Maybe you even have a dissolved air flotation system, a DAF. And then you have to pay again to discharge that to your city publicly owned treatment works, who in turn discharges it to the local water body. Now we're gonna introduce this word we saw in the title of this webinar, best practice. So better than the traditional system, your system is paying for the water to come in. Maybe you're doing a little water recovery or repurposing and you're realizing some water reductions. And now a little bit less water is going to the, your pretreatment system at your facility. But it's probably advanced a little bit. It's not just a grease interceptor. Maybe you do a DAF now. Maybe you're even having a biological system. And again, you discharge to the city. So let's explore what that might look like in the future. There's not many facilities doing this right now, but this is where we see things heading with the current increase in costs and the supply of water being reduced. So we're coming into the plant. That's not changing. You're still getting those water reductions and you're still doing some wastewater pretreatment. But now it's getting to be a more complex, larger system, which costs a little bit more. But what you get out of that is direct potable reuse. It is possible to treat that to a potable water standard and reuse it within the facility. That's all within your fence line. You may still be discharging out to the city. And in the future, the alternate to that direct reuse within the fence line is possibly it goes out to the city on a separate pipe back to the potable water treatment plant, not the wastewater treatment plant. So that would be indirect potable reuse, where it gets mixed at the municipal level and then gets redistributed to your facility and to other users. And then we come to our first poll. Does your dairy facility already have restrictions on water use? Are you feeling that supply crunch? We'll go ahead and have a couple seconds here for some responses. Okay, pretty evenly split. If you can see the poll results up on your screen, I'm showing 45% already have restrictions, the 55% do not. And we'll say do not yet, because more than likely things will get tighter. All right, and with that, I'd like to pass it off to Warren, who will lead you through some water strategy ideas. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Joe, I appreciate that. Uh, what we'd like to do now is present what Hickson's been implementing for quite a few years. As Danielle mentioned at the beginning, I joined Hickson in 2002. And at that time, Hickson had already established what they referred to as a waste buster program. And as we got further into that, uh, working with our clients to reduce uh, waste to the POTW, uh, we branched that off and developed as well, uh, in parallel with it, a water reduction program. 
So this is something that Hickson's had in place for quite a few years, and uh, it was one of the motivations for us to share it with you today. Uh, what you're seeing on the, the screen is a model. Uh, it's based on some of the quality programs that Hickson participates in. Uh, this circle is a plan, do, check, act, or PVCA cycle. And we used it as a model for how we uh, would use it for uh, water or waste minimization. Uh, it begins with the uh, benchmarking of water usage, goes to surveying uh, where the water is being used in the plant and what those costs are. You then do the, uh, the check uh, phase of the, uh, the quality circle, which is to audit your facility and check for where water is being used or how you can reduce uh, water in your facility. And then the action phase is where you would take those ideas, uh, develop a plan and then monitor progress as you implement them. So what we're gonna present this afternoon during this part of the presentation is how to go about uh, running this, what are the advantages, and we'll show you some actual examples uh, that Hickson has collected over the years, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So we'll begin with benchmarking and the, bench, the common benchmark uh, you'll see this both for waste and for water. Uh, there's a wastewater uh, use ratio and also a water use ratio or WUR. Uh, these are, have been benchmarked by Hickson and also by the industry across uh, various different segments. Uh, and what it, it's on a very high level is simply the total water that you buy over the total amount of product that you produce. And that could be by either a, a volume of product, a gallon to gallon ratio, or a gallon to pound ratio. And just to share with you some of the, uh, the statistics that Hickson's gathered over the years. Uh, on the left, uh, we've uh, worked with a variety of uh, different beverage clients, bakery. I've highlighted in red the dairy uh, segments that we work in with fluid milk or combination dairies, where you might have a uh, fluid milk with a cottage cheese or yogurt production at the same facility. Uh, some pure cheese uh, production facilities, some ice cream plants, and so forth. Um, and then we also were able to gather some industrial uh, data for, on the global side, and, and very similar types of numbers uh, to help confirm what we were actually seeing uh, in the field at, at our clients' facilities. Uh, the data that you're, sh that you're seeing, uh, if we take an example, like for the fluid milk, the average across all the plants that Hickson's worked with is about 1.7 gallons of incoming water for every gallon of milk that leaves the, the plant with a range of anywhere from one to two gallons per gallon. So let's take an example. Let's say your facility uh, wants to initiate a water management uh, program. And right now you're looking at your bills and you know that you're, you're buying uh, about two gallons for every gallon that you produce. And as uh, if you were to take Hickson's uh, average over North America of about 1.7, then you could say that you've got an opportunity of about 0.3 gallons per gallon of milk that you're producing. If you're a 70 million gallon a year milk plant, that's almost 21 million gallons of water per year that you could potentially save just to get to the industrial average for your type of facility. So how are we gonna go about getting those 21 million gallons? The next step is to first figure out what, what's the cost of that water and then to put together the, uh, the, the, the program uh, for doing that. Uh, one thing about the cost uh, to look at is that different waters have different costs and we'll be examining that later in the presentation. But just from a high level, those 21 million gallons would break down into about 126,000 gallons in potable water treating that water, another $168,000. And then uh, another uh, element that we want to emphasize during this presentation is something that we call value-added costs. Uh, that water that comes in, some of it's heated, some of it's cooled, uh, some of it is gonna be softened or treated with CIP chemicals. And all of those are gonna be added to the water and eventually, uh, could, could eventually go to the POTW as well. Uh, those, those costs, add up to another $53,000. Uh, so that 21 million uh, gallons of water is well over a quarter million dollars in annual savings that will also occur as well in operating costs. So it takes us to the next 
phase of the program, which is to survey your plant, map out where the water is being used, and to develop the costs that I just spoke to. At Hickson, we uh, like to put together a, a standardized sheet that we would use uh, for visiting each site. Uh, you could put this together for each of your own facilities. Uh, but the idea is just to have a, a common practice and a common uh, procedure for going about the survey. You want to look at uh, all your production uh, areas, look at your utility areas, and then also be looking at your non-production domestic water usages, such as in your labs or in your offices. For developing the water use ratio, you need to meter the water that's coming into the facility. And most commonly, that's going to be available just by the, uh, the municipal uh, water meters, the gas meters, the electrical meters that are on the outside of the facility. There's other metering that can be implemented and that we'd like to see implemented so that you can have a continuous uh, eye on where the water is going throughout the facility. And those are going to be two other tiers that I'll explain. The next tier down, we call tier two. Uh, this is where you might put metering on the major branches in your facility. So you could see exactly where all the potable water is being used, any water that's going to a water treatment area in your facility, or going to your utilities department. And then some facilities take it even a step further in what we would call tier three metering, where they might have metering on, say, a landscaping uh, for the outside exterior of the facility. Uh, we've had clients that meter the water that's going into particular areas like a blend room or processing or CIP, or that's dedicated to an engine room or to a boiler house. The advantage of these is twofold. One is that you get a breakdown of where the water is being used and you can continuously see uh, relationships between how the water is being used and maybe what products that you're producing or the volume of products that you're producing. Uh, maybe with weather conditions, et cetera. The, the other is something called a deduct meter. And this is where you work with the city uh, for water that you know that will not end up in the POTW if it's landscape water or if it's water that's going directly into a product, it can be classified as a deduct meter. And that will uh, allow you to reduce your uh, uh, water that is coming into the plant uh, being counted toward your uh, outgoing water volume. So it takes us to our next uh, polling question. We'd be curious to know um, for your facilities, whether you're doing any of the tiered metering that I discussed. Uh, firstly, uh, we know that you've got your incoming water, but also are you doing any tier two, maybe looking at major water areas or on a tier three level process specific water usages? We'll take a few minutes for let you to uh, answer the poll question. As I mentioned, we do have clients that, that do like to do the uh, the tier two. And it looks like uh, the majority of the users uh, do have the incoming water meters, obviously. And about a third of you uh, do have the tier two meters. And that's great to see. And others uh, have gone even a step further and have uh, specific water uh, uh, metering on a, on a tier three level. So it's, it's great to see. And I hope you're, you're realizing the benefit of that as well. And that's what, uh, what Joe and I are going to continue to talk about is how, how you can take now take that information and start to leverage that into a water management program. So the next step, let's look at the cost. Uh, you know, you're going to purchase that water. And as I mentioned earlier, you're going to add value to that water. And then you're going to have to treat that water that uh, is not being used in your product that uh, now needs to go to the POTW. Hickson's been keeping an eye on water costs and th they are very wide across the United States. Uh, we've seen everything as low as two to $3 per thousand gallons to anywhere eight to $10 per thousand gallons, depending on where you're located in the United States. A good national average right now is running around six. Now, when we speak of value add, just think about what you're doing to the water. Uh, some of you are having to soften the water, so you're paying for treatment chemicals, salts, resins. Uh, with regard to steam or condensate that gets lost and goes down the drain, you're having to pay for boiler treatment chemicals. You're uh, putting heat energy into that to create, actually generate the steam. 
cooling towers, you have water treatment chemicals, uh, CIP and so forth. So when you look at the true cost of lost steam, be it as condensate or boiler blowdown, it's not the $6 per thousand, it actually adds up to closer to $15.10 in this example. As you can see, the, you've got where you, you can start to focus your, your time and energy is, where am I losing high value water? I'm losing it as steam or as CIP. Am I losing softened water, cooling towers and so forth? So now we're halfway through the program. You've, you've decided what your target's gonna be. Uh, you've gone through and uh, you've decided or determined what your, your water costs are. And you've got a water survey program. You've got meters in place so you can keep an eye on how the water's being used. And now you wanna start to audit your facility and find your opportunities. We break these opportunities down into four basic categories. The first is, like the old uh, Nike slogan, just do it, as we used to term them uh, when we were doing our waste busters. And uh, it applies just as well to water uh, waste busting as well. And the idea here is to find the low hanging fruit, if you will. The second is water efficiency. And as our little slogan on the right says, use it wisely, every drop counts. You know you have to use the water, but we wanna try to use it as effectively as possible. The next are water alternatives. And then the last is water repurposing and reuse. So just a couple examples. We'll, we'll start with each of these with a, a kind of a working definition. So our water waste busters is to discontinue or reduce preventable water losses. And our experience shows that these are mostly plant maintenance issues and operating practices. A couple examples would be to repair those nagging water leaks and steam leaks and to change some operating practices. And one that I'll uh, illustrate is what we call, refer to as water brooming, where you use your water stations uh, as, a, as a broom instead of uh, doing dry solids or wet solid pickup. So let's start with the, the plant maintenance example. Uh, just a really minor leak, a 30 second inch hole and a 40 pound water line uh, if you want to do like the old traditional bucket test, uh, or you can use uh, the A American Water Works Association's Greeley's formula, that would amount to about 0.15 GPM. It's really not a lot, but when you add that up over the course of a year running continuously, it's almost 80,000 gallons a year in water or 1,200 gallons for that small leak. And that accounts for both the purchase water as well as that water going down the drain and being treated. Perfectly good water going right down the drain. Likewise, with water brooming, uh, opportunities where you might have uh, cheese curds or yogurt solids or whatever it might be on the floor, a lot of times uh, the most expedient thing is to grab a water hose and push it down the drain. You're paying for the BOD, you're paying for the water. When it, uh, If you have a dry cleanup program and a the right refuse uh, dumpster, then, um, then you can change uh, what could be a, a lengthy wet cleanup of that, that area to um, a more reduced cleanup time. And in this example might save, say around 20,000 gallons a year per hose station, as well as the BOD save that you're not sending to the, the POTW. So just two quick examples. Um, the next would be water efficiency. These are practices and technologies where we wanna use water more economically. Uh, so these are cases where, again, you're, you know you need to use the water, but you want to take a look at how your machines are designed, uh, what your water usage is, and where it's at. Uh, we'll give a couple different examples of how you can optimize system and how that water is being used to reduce the water being consumed. Uh, one classic one is uh, tuning up your CIP circuits. Uh, the real, you know, essence here is to, you know, with any CIP is to have the right water velocity and the right duration. And we find that both the, the water velocity needs some tailoring, but the duration is, is one of the big opportunities. And the duration can be adjusted in particular on like the first push. If you have uh, an opacity meter at the end of the line, or maybe you can look at conductivity or bricks uh, to help with the phase transition. 
so that every cycle, uh, maybe if you, as you change products, uh, it's not always going to have to be a 20 minute cycle. It could be 10 for one product, or maybe it needs to be 25 for another before you get that, that line cleared out. Another great way if you've got viscous products or heavy products is to consider a, a pigging system to get that product. And uh, this has a twofold advantage. One is to push that product to a recovery tank where it can be uh, sent off site rather than sent to the POTW. Uh, the other is that it simply uh, gets the bulk of the mass out of the line before you have to do a water push. So a couple of ideas there to think about that you would implement from a technology perspective to reduce your water usage. So one example, if you had a, a two inch uh, CIP line, you'd wanna run that at about 45 GPM to get sort of the classic five feet per second. Uh, if you could implement some of the technologies that I mentioned, just knock five minutes off of that cycle with five product changes a day, just that one tune-up is 40, 400,000 gallons a year in water usage. Another one, uh, if you've got a, a pump, uh, it's got a double mechanical seal and Hickson often uh, recommends and ins installs these uh, for sugar lines and sweetener lines. And those mechanical seals are typically uh, flushed with water at a really low rate, uh, only about a quarter GPM. Uh, but if that pump is idle for 12 hours a day and you've got it set up where it's flushing continuously, that amounts to about 66,000 gallons a year in water. Uh, th that water can be saved uh, by installing, and we see in this example on the right, uh, a small solenoid valve so that it comes on, flushes the seal before the pump starts, uh, continues the water during the operation of the pump, and then when the pump stops, we'll do a, a brief flush before it shuts off. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a simple technology to implement, but it's one worthwhile thinking about um, on your pump seals. Alternative waters uh, is a practice in technologies that requires little to no potable water or it uses a fresh potable or, or fresh potable water intake. And you achieve that by collecting rainwater um, or something referred to as xeriscaping, which is to actually change how you landscape your property. Hickson's implemented uh, a number of these rainwater collection uh, systems. Uh, this example in the bottom right was at a facility in the Midwest where we were collecting water off the roof of a warehouse. And uh, based on the uh, average water rainfall in this area amounts to about 750,000 gallons of rainwater a year that's being collected in these two fiberglass tanks outside the facility. That water was then being used in gray water applications and in the utility plant and non-contact applications uh, after some uh, minor treatment of the water, mostly just to uh, reduce the bio load uh, that naturally comes with rainwater and uh, other solids uh, that were in that from uh, wash off, rain off, wash off off the roof. Uh, and then for the, this facility wanting to get lead points, uh, that also applied uh, toward those. Xeriscaping is adapting your property for the, uh, the natural environment that, that the facility is located in. Uh, your landscape property uh, will have a different classifications of uh, what they would refer to as a low, medium, and high water demand plantings. And a, a good mix of those uh, can be used strategically to still maintain an attractive property while also reducing the water. Uh, so a, a traditional high water use irrigated lawn, uh, 50,000 square foot uh, would require a significant amount of water, whereas a mixed use uh, property can save, uh, by our calculations, almost a million gallons a year. Uh, if you're in a, a drought uh, area, and you can see these examples in the bottom at one of our clients' facilities uh, in the um, American Southwest, uh, they actually eliminated their lawn altogether and used natural plantings with cacti and uh, other shrubs and um, trees that were native to that area and forego the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, golf course lawn that is a very high water demand user. The last is uh, water repurposing and reuse. There's, here you know that you've got water, but you're gonna find ways that you can use it a second time or continuously within a plant rather than discharging it to the POTW. 
Um, two examples, uh, another one is a CIP use, and uh, most of your CIP systems are likely gonna have this, but we thought we'd just mention it, which is where you're gonna use the final rinse water on your CIP as a first push for the next cycle. Uh, there, there are a number of facilities that still have uh, single use tanks, uh, but if you've got an opportunity where you can put in a, a water capture tank and reuse that for your, your first pushes, uh, you're cutting your water usage in half just by virtue of installing that tank. Uh, the example I'm gonna also show is uh, like if you had an RO water system, uh, you know that you're gonna have to do weekly back flushes or rinses on those. And we often find that if you're producing RO water for formulating a product, that uh, that's relatively clean water that can be reused uh, in non-potable applications. Example of a tank that we installed just for that purpose. All right, so Warren described a lot of ways to use that water and find ways to keep from using it. But how do we get to that possibility of reusing water if it's already gone down the drain? So let's step through some of the technologies here for the wastewater pretreatment system that you would have to purchase as part of your facility if you wanted to reuse the water there. What we start with is a design basis of around 200,000 gallons, gallons per day at a typical dairy facility. Now, what we would start with is primary treatment, and that is defined as the physical and chemical removal of pollutants. At a very basic level, that's a grease interceptor, silt interceptor, um, maybe that's a screen, and it goes all the way up to a DAF system, which is still considered physical chemical removal because a DAF system is just adding air to the water, assisting things with flotation, maybe a little bit of chemical usage there as well, and also some final pH adjustment before it goes off to the city. In those systems, at the very basic grease interceptor, you're at $100,000. At a moderately sized DAF with a building around it, you're looking closer to the $2 million number. What that gets you, however, is very limited reuse capabilities. Your BOD and suspended solids are still quite a bit higher than you would consider for even a gray water use. So what we have to do is go to that secondary treatment step before we can think about some reuse possibilities. And the secondary treatment is defined as the biological reduction of pollutants. That's where we have a aerobic system or anaerobic system or a combination thereof, one then the other to reduce the BOD, COD, TSS, adjust the pH, and then a filtering or separation step at the end to remove all the biological matter and get to some clear water. So after that clearing or clarification step, uh, we actually have some limited reuse options. Um, typically there's non-GMP uses uh, we can talk about truck wash, we could talk about irrigation, we can talk about cleanup maybe at dock spaces, um, non-contact type stuff, and typically not within the process space. So what do we need to do if we need to go to the next step? If we're in a severe shortage area and the water supply is just not there, we're going to have to step to what we call the tertiary treatment step. And that's where after the biological step, this is tertiary is where you would be discharging to a surface water. It would be good enough for that, but it's not potable yet. So what we have to do is what your city water supply treatment is actually doing. You can think of that. That's the tertiary step. You're taking something that's nearly ready for use or reuse and you're doing a physical or biological specialized step. And that's typically a nanofiltration, RO filtration, in addition to some disinfection. 
So once we've cleaned it, we have to make sure it stays clean and usable. So that tertiary step is gonna run you anywhere from say a quarter million to $2 million, depending on what kind of step you need to get to. And that allows you to do the full reuse. At that point, along with a little bit of disinfection with um, typically ozone and UV or a chlorinated addition, uh, that'll get you to the same potable water standards. So then you've got some water you can reuse inside and you're gonna have to find the uses for your lightly used water. Uh, again, we'd like to minimize product contact, although it is technically uh, the same as the potable water that's coming into your site, uh, there's still a little bit of hesitation from an optic standpoint that you have to overcome. Uh, in addition, sanitation requirements are becoming a little more strict. There are food safety concerns there. So the additional operator requirements, the additional monitoring and testing requirements are gonna come into play there. So there's some additional challenges. And obviously you need to think about your local, state and federal requirements, especially your PMO and HACCP. But it is not impossible. There are many manufacturing locations that are doing this right now and have been since the mid 2000s. Um, we can uh, give you information if you'd like to request that on some breweries. Um, Orange County, California is doing that as a municipality. So it's not impossible. You can get there and in the future you might have to get there depending on where you're located. So go ahead Warren. So like we were talking about for those locations, cooling towers, boiler water makeup, uh, the gray water system can be connected to the toilets. Uh, anything external to the building, fine with personnel exposure type stuff with landscaping or truck, truck wash, and you know external to the building hose stations. So now we get to poll question three. So if you are planning in the future to treat and reuse process water, what degree do you think you would have to get to? And feel free to choose several here. And we'll give you a few seconds for that. Here's some gears grinding. Sounds like we're working hard on this one. All right. Let's take a look at these. Um, looks like a lot of people are gonna go for some utility reuse. Cooling towers are very popular. Uh, the evaporation being easy to deal with since you have blow down from those anyway. Gray water is also very popular. If you have some irrigation to do, that's an easy win. You don't have to worry about product contact. Um, Non-ingredient reuse, big user. And looks like a third of the people here are thinking that possibly they'd like to get back to ingredient water standards, which is a great goal. Um, that is a high user and something that you may eventually have to get there. So congratulations to that 33% uh, there. So back to you, Warren. Yep, so that takes us to the last phase of the plan do check act. So we're in the act phase. So you, we've, we've gotten an audit of our facility. And we know where they're at. Now we need to prioritize our water projects. What are our options? Implement them and monitor progress. The pattern that, that we see, and you, you could probably surmise by the examples that I gave, that the waste busters kind of start in the low hanging fruit examples that I mentioned earlier. Uh, low cost to implement, not a lot of return, but they're, uh, they're out there as operational and process changes, just regular, just do it, plant maintenance type activities. 
The next uh, starts to get more out of your expense budget and start in, gets into capital type of expenditures where you're looking at efficiencies, alternatives, and repurpose and reuse. You start to uh, incur a higher cost to implement, but you really start to see the, the greater uh, purchased uh, water uh, return savings. And then just to recap, if we were to take a look at some of the examples that I gave and put these together right now into um, sort of our own little program, uh, we found six minor water leaks that we wanted to fix, resulted in almost half a million gallons a year in water. We wanted to implement a water use practice change in a CIP system and also to adjust a CIP push, which was almost another half million gallons a year in water usage. We found a few pump seals. We wanted to correct the, the seal flush and how that's being operated, about a quarter of a million gallons a year. And then uh, another operational change, we want to repurpose some water uh, coming off an RO water system, about a half a million gallons. So operationally, we found about 1.6 million gallons a year that we're going to change uh, by changing some practices and implementing some easy technologies. Uh, some of the, the more, the higher end of the investment side, if we go back to that diagram again, so we're, we're now we're in the kind of the alternative repurposing. Uh, we're looking at some some higher return opportunities, but some higher cost uh, type opportunities, which would be to put in a, a rainwater harvesting uh, tanks and system, and uh, some 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 mild treatment so we can reuse it as a gray water in our utilities department, and then uh, rework our landscaping and irrigation practices. So another uh, one and a half, 1.7 million gallons a year in water, water alternatives. Joe? All right, thank you, Warren. So thinking about the future, managing that risk of the water shortages and increasing costs, we want to talk about controlling your destiny, and that's going to fall into a couple segments here. One for existing plants. So at your existing plants, after you've gone through that cycle that Warren just described, uh, you also have to think about anticipating that reduced water availability. And that availability might be the shortage or the cost aspect. So what you have to do is when you're looking at an expansion of your site, maybe you're putting in a new line, consider upsizing the wastewater pretreatment system at that time, um, or thinking about the adding technology to the existing wastewater system, going from primary to secondary, or even maybe the tertiary step, so you have something to reuse. Um, at the very least, keep a layout footprint ready for some wastewater if you know your area might have a water shortage coming where that reuse is going to become more important. Also, um, look at the cost of the water that you've just calculated using Warren's method and compare that to your profit margins realistically so that you have an idea of if the water went up to this cost, should we even continue producing at this area? You might have to shift to another location. And if you have several facilities and you can be a little more flexible, consider looking at where the products are that use the most water, moving them to facilities where water shortages and costs are not that big of an issue. Another thing in your existing facilities, Warren had talked about metering the water and understanding where the water losses are. The other thing you can do for the costs of the wastewater are in location number one, after some pretreatment going out to the city, you have a flow meter. So at least you know how much is going off to the city. But let's think about location two here between the plant and your pretreatment system. Here you have a little bit more opportunity to understand immediately what's going on in the facility to cause your water losses. So not only would a flow meter work well in location two, but a lot of facilities are starting to put in technologies 
like Warren mentioned in the CIP systems for water push. Here in wastewater, you can think of it as the large water push. So an opacity meter, conductivity meter, depending on what you're looking for, can help tell you within minutes what happened at the plant. And a large jump in opacity may indicate some product losses. And then you can go back and track down what just happened that day. You're not looking at your bill a month from now wondering what happened. What if we have the opportunity for a new facility? So for looking at a new facility and including, you know, things like labor force and energy costs, try to think about that water strategy in your long-term plans there too. Go to the municipality, ask them about future water availability. Are they going to increase the limitations on any wastewater pollutants soon? Like phosphorus is a dairy constituent in the wastewater that is starting to be implemented at municipalities. You're starting to get wastewater limits for phosphorus. And then ask them about the condition of the public water and wastewater infrastructure. Are they, do they have plans to spend more to upgrade things? Have they spent anything in the last 10 years? If they haven't, there might be big costs coming down the line. And then here's some more questions to ask them, them being the municipality. Um, has there been a prevalence of water shortages recently? What's the weather been like? Are they considering any water use restrictions to the manufacturing sites around there? Again, have their water and wastewater costs remain level? Are they on a nice steady increase that's predictable? And do they anticipate any tighter wastewater limits? And we have arrived at our last slide. So in summary, we've talked about establishing a measurement system for your water usage, finding and knowing your water's value so you can more easily calculate whether specific uh, technology or equipment changes would be beneficial, making sure you understand your whole facility water management plan, both the incoming water and the wastewater going out, you now may expect to invest more money on the water reuse and treatment side of things. And we've given you a little bit of a push to stay informed at the local level and try to avoid surprises for yourself because anytime you can reduce the variability and assist your facility in operating more consistently, you're gonna avoid those surprises and generally everybody's a lot happier then. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. I want to remind the audience that um, you can ask questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We do have a couple minutes for some questions. And I do have a couple that I would like uh, that have come in that I'd like to ask. Um, the first question is, uh, are you aware of any considerations for direct potable reuse of appropriate wastewater? You may have answered that before already, but I did want to ask the question specifically. Um, yeah, I think we've addressed that a little bit with the um, push toward the non-potable re or non-process reuse. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can avoid the ingredient water reuse until necessary. Uh, irrigation has always been a good one and we're seeing cooling water tower usage uh, increasing in prevalence. So those are the, the typical ones, um, shortly followed by utility water, boiler makeup and such. Great, I have, I have another question. Um, how, what is the approximate cost of water meters, such as the portable ultrasonic water meters? Yeah, Joe, I can take that one. Um, we, we happen to use uh, <clears throat> a portable ultrasonics uh, if we're on a plant survey. And it's something that you can rent yourself. And the trade-off is 
is is twofold. One, you know, for a couple thousand dollars, you can rent a portable meter and go through the facility. And the advantage we see in doing that is that you can find specific locations in your plant where you might want to make a decision between where, where do I want to do a tier two or tier three water metering? Where am I going to get the most advantage before I do a permanent installation? Uh, so we would, during our water surveys, we'll, we'll rent one of those ourselves, uh, and bring it with us or have it delivered to the site. And then we can set it up and collect the data uh, during the course of, of operations. And then once you've decided on where you want to install your tier two and tier three meters, then you can go back and put in a permanent installation. Uh, the advantage of, of that as, as well as uh, the ultrasonics is that they're sort of strap on or bolt on technologies. Uh, you, it's not, not invasive in terms of having to cut into pipe, shut down operations so you can leave things uh, operational. And so those can be installed on a permanent basis as well for a, a couple thousand dollars at each of the different applications. Okay, another question is, is there a good industry definition for the for gray water? Hmm. Well, the, the best definition for water is potable water. And that's the one that's gonna be regulated. Uh, Joe had mentioned earlier about the, the PMO uh, or uh, on the federal or local level uh, or state level is gonna have their own requirements for potable water. And really everything that's, that's short of potable water uh, might be fall into that kind of gray water application. And then it's gonna depend on your facility. Uh, so if you, if you know what kind of water say that your boiler needs uh, or the water that your uh, uh, cooling tower can take uh, those other types of applications are each facility is going to define for themselves what kind of water quality do I need uh, coming in, into those. And then so that difference between what would be wastewater, what's potable water, that sort of is the, hence the name that's kind of the gray area. And uh, you'll have to find, you know, what, what, as we mentioned during the survey, you have to define what's the quality of the water that you've got available and what's the quality of water that you need for each of those different applications and just right, you know, kind of find the right, uh, the right match between the two. Yeah, one, of the, one of the, yeah, if I could, I'm sorry, Daniel, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, one of the examples that I gave with the RO water system as an example is uh, at, at the facility where we collected that water uh, off the RO water generator, uh, that was actually plumbed through what we call the gray water line and it went to uh, the toilet facilities uh, in the labs and the, uh, the administration building. So that water was directly reused. It had its own dedicated uh, gray water line for that water. Okay, we have two minutes. I have one more quick question. Um, hopefully I can get this right. Uh, when we're talking about food and beverage plants, dairy plants, there's a lot of water and, and gray water and waste. Um, that can overwhelm a municipality. Um, how do you work with the municipality to let them know what's available to them, at, well, available at the plant, and what the municipality would need to do to make up to make up for it on their end? Um, municipalities are aware of the need for reuse and the water shortages. Uh, each municipality has typically a couple people dedicated to planning and they typically publish a five to 20 year plan on the kind of things they're going to need to do in the next decade or two. And they base those estimations on population changes and such. So they've got some plans out there that you can ask to look at. Uh, some of them are available online, some are not. And the best way to do that is talk to those planning specialists and you know, invite them to the facility and tell them, this is what we've got now. This is where our water is. Um, maybe you can share some plans about, hey, we're considering doing this. Is there a location or a um, opportunity at the city where you know, we could discharge straight to this area or that area. Would that help you guys out? And open those negotiations. So 
they've got plans. You've possibly got some plans or something existing now. Just just get together and start talking. There's there's definitely some opportunities that I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, to discuss with you. Great, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Warren, for this for this incredibly detailed and informative webinar. Thank you, Hickson, for this. Um, for those of you um, online, the the recording and the slides for this webinar will be made available on the in the IDFA Knowledge Center. So if you missed it, or if you want others in your at your team to to view this, it'll be available shortly. And I want to close this webinar again. Thank you for everyone at Hickson for all the work that went into this and was very informative.